Yes, I am ready to begin. Uh, blessings, uh, uh, saints, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for prayer. Uh, we thank God this morning, and we glorify his name for his goodness. Uh, the psalmist says he, he forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases. If we believe him to forgive our sins for real, it should not be hard for us to also believe that he heals our diseases as well. So this morning we are dealing with a very key subject because I can see believers everywhere, uh, you know, stand up to pray, stand up to seek uh, the face of the Lord. And the Lord put in my heart uh, for me to speak about the qualifications uh, of prayer. So we'll be dealing with about seven qualifications of prayer that must be met. They are conditions, they are conditional, they are key, particularly for us who practice prayer. You remember the Bible says we ought to pray without ceasing, and we also need to also remember that we are the people of prayer. Uh, Jesus Christ, present or current ministry as he seated in heaven, the places, is making intercession for, for the saints. So today I want us to really look at some things that might make prayer to work or that might lead to prayer not working for a believer, hence the word qualifications. Now, I just want to explain what is a qualification. A qualification is a condition that must be met before a right is given. I repeat, a qualification is a condition that must be met before a right is granted. Now, if you remember, if you can go to First Timothy chapter number three, uh, you would understand that uh, there are qualifications for elders. For instance, we are told there that an elder must be self-controlled. If he does not exercise self-control, he's not qualified to be an elder. The elder must be hospitable. Those are qualifications. If he can't exercise hospitality, is not qualified to, to actually lead. An elder must be able to teach. That is the qualification of an elder because his office requires that. An elder must not be violent, but gentle. That is a qualification uh, of an elder. An elder must not be quarrelsome because these are the things that will disqualify a person from the office of eldership. Hence, it must not be given to children, no vices. Uh, it, it, it is a, a position for the mature in Christ. An elder must not be a lover of money. An elder must not be a recent convert. An elder must have a good reputation with outsiders. Uh, an elder must not be overbearing. An elder must not be quick tempered because he's going to deal with people and situations. An elder must also be upright and, and holy. Those are the qualifications that we are familiar with. When saints talk about qualifications uh, from the point of scripture, they think about those of an elder. However, today I want to bring to our understanding that there is, there are qualifications for, for prayer. Now we are going to read one of the verse that has been unfortunately butchered or misinterpreted by some. Some have taught it. And they, they have taught it to imply that it means, but when you look at it, 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 look at the verse within its context, you will then understand that that's not what it means. And it is because of this verse, as I was studying, I saw that uh, if we don't take care of interpreting this verse accurately, we might end up having prayer practice baselessly. Prayer is not a baseless practice. Prayer is governed by the word. Prayer is, uh, in, we are in, as, as a result, we are instructed to, to pray. Prayer is not just something we do for the sake of, you know, making sure that we cover space or time or we show people that we can pray. Prayer has qualifications. Now, because of how this verse has been interpreted, uh, there is a reason why I need to provide for us seven qualifications uh, for, of prayer for us. Now, Mbuli, please read for us John chapter number 20, 
uh, not 20, John chapter number 16, verse 24. John chapter number 16, verse 24. We can also put it on a church section. If you are at home and you are reading with me, we are opening John chapter number 16, verse 24. On face value and on casual interpretation, people just would think that this verse, this verse suggests that Christ has opened us to a baseless practice of prayer that has no condition. Uh, can we read the verse? John 16, verse 24. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Amen. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now these qualifications are necessary, especially if you are going to do prayer in his name. Remember, we are not supposed to treat the name of the Lord in vain. So if you are going to involve the name of the Lord in prayer, you are going to have to meet certain qualifications. But on face value or casually, when you read this verse, to some, they have taken the words of Jesus to mean that prayer can be, we can, we can, we can use prayer and ask for things without meeting conditions and receive whatever we want from Jesus. In other words, a person can just pray in his name and as they pray in his name, unconditionally receive whatever they want from Jesus. Unfortunately, that's not what this verse means. And this verse will be dangerous for a person who reads it and then takes it in isolation without uh, knowing that Jesus had already said some conditions uh, that seeks to ensure that we meet all the biblical qualifications for prayer. So if you take this verse in isolation and you do not balance it with what Jesus said in other places and what the apostles taught about prayer in other places, it might mean that prayer is just uh, something that we do in order we, to get what we want from God without meeting certain qualifications. And this is the reason why sometimes some of the prayers are actually not answered. There are prayers that are not answered because they do not meet the qualifications for prayer. So this verse does not mean that you can just show up in prayer, ask anything that you, you want from Jesus, especially if you use his name without meeting the qualifications. So as we look into the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament precisely, we are going to see that there are qualifications that balances the statement set by the Lord because Jesus cannot contradict himself. He's the one speaking in this verse. We are also going to see the other place where he speaks in this verse. So here's the first qualification of prayer. The first qualification of prayer is that prayer should, that we should abide in him. The first qualification of prayer is that we should abide in him. I want you to put that on our chat section. Based on John chapter 15, verse number seven. After you read John 16, 24, you understand, you take Jesus' example in John chapter number 15, verse seven, where he says something that seeks to govern how we pray and sets up a condition and a qualification. So we are checking the first qualification that until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. But before you engage into that, you ought to meet the qualification. And the first qualification that we have of prayer is found in John chapter 15, verse number seven. And I will explain what it means. This qualification is that whoever who prays must abide in the Lord. Can we read the verse, please, Mbuli? John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Amen. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is a very clear verse. Same 
quotation by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is our first qualification, abiding in him. Now, it is important that I explain for you this condition of abiding in him and what it entails or what are the three things I believe or four things that I believe in, it involves based on Christ's words. What does it mean practically or from the scriptures to abide in him? I'm going to just mention a, a number of, uh, of things that connect to us with abiding in him so that the qualification of abiding in him is understood by a believer so that prayer can become a productive exercise, not a futile exercise. Now, what does it mean then? And what does it involve to abide in him? Because we are told those who pray must abide in him. Now, it involves the fact that you must be discipled by him. Abiding in him means you must be discipled by him. You ought to be a follower. I, I, I took the example of the disciples, those that were walking with Christ, that they, they were together with him all the time. I'm actually connecting with, with the issue of, I am the vine, Jesus says, and you are the branches. So the branches were close to the vine, and as a result of that, produce fruits. So the best way a believer can produce a fruit is that he must be discipled by him. And what is a disciple? A learner. And what is the common word we use on disciple? That a disciple is a follower. Jesus went to Matthew, the text collector, and said, follow me. Jesus challenged a number of people and told them to leave this and that and follow him. And we understand the cost of discipleship. So to abide in him, actually, uh, in, in more practical sense, for us today, it means to be discipled by him. Now, that is a qualification concerning connected with abiding in him in prayer. You must be discipled by him. So we are going to quote John chapter 8, verse number 31 and 32. That has to do with, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So abiding in him, the first thing it involves it involves being discipled by him. Please, let's put those verses in our church section. John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32. And I think you should be asking yourself serious questions. Are you a follower of Christ? It positions you and it conditions, it, it qualifies you for prayer. The second thing that we have to understand concerning abiding in him on this first qualification is that we should be led by him. People that abide in him must be led by him. A verse that we know in Romans chapter 8, verse number 14. Romans chapter 8, verse number 14. I'm repeating these verses so that we can allow admin to put those verses in our chat section. You should be led by him. Abiding in him also involves being led by him. You know the verse, it says that those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And I understand most people quote this verse uh, for the purposes of speaking, you know, being led and being moved, moving in the gifts of the Spirit. It does involve that. But primarily, it speaks to us about the fact that the Holy Spirit leads us to lead a Christ-centered life. I've come to admire one uh, uh, the prayer that is made by... Uh, Kelejo, uh, uh, Mabusa, uh, when she prays, she says, Lord, help us to live your Christian life, you know, your Christ life through you. When I, when I thought about those words, I'm like, uh, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing. That is actually the role of the Holy Spirit. So abiding in him also involves the fact that we are led by him. So before you pray, are you led by him? Are you discipled by him? Because that's how that is going to shape your prayer life. That is definitely going to shape. Being discipled by him and being led by him will shape your prayer life. And thirdly, abiding in him also has to do with the fact that we put him first. We put him first. So I have Matthew chapter number 6, verse 33. Admin will put that on our chat section. 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, a common verse as well that we know that says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So abiding in him also involves the fact of putting him first. This is important. These are important principles in shaping your prayer life and qualifying you for prayer. Because this is how your words then are going to be guided. Remember what John 16, 24 says. It says, until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. But those who do so must be a people who abide in him. And by that we mean they are discipled by him. They are led by him, by his spirit. And they, are, they put him first. Because that's how your words in prayer are going to be shaped by your relationship with God. And lastly, uh, John chapter 15, verse number 10, abiding in him has to do with keeping his commandments. And I'm going to unpack because it's connected to the second qualification, actually this one. But abiding in him also involves keeping his commandments. I would love for us to read this verse because it clearly speaks into the context of what it means to abide in him. John chapter 15, verse number 10. Please don't forget this qualification is important for a people of prayer. Intercessors, uh, prayer warriors, and all those who are moved into intercession. All of us moved also in intercession. We should understand that there are qualifications, that prayer is not a baseless exercise, but in order for it to be a pro productive, effective exercise, so that it guarantees God's answers, we ought to meet the qualifications stated in the scriptures. Please, let's read John chapter number 15, verse number 10. John 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Amen. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, just like Christ has kept God's commandment and abide, abide in his love. So the same way for us, the relationship between Christ and the church reflects our relationship, uh, the relationship between Christ uh, and God, the Father, reflects our relationship with Christ. The same way he kept the commandment, the same way he abide in the Father. So in the same way, our abiding in the Father has to do with the issue of keeping his commandment. So this is a very important qualification. So it already disqualifies us for a number of reasons stated in the scriptures that I have provided. No wonder some prayers are not answered. The question will be, are you discipled by him? Are you led by him? Do you put him first? And are you keeping his commandment before you open your mouth to pray? May, have, may, the, may the almighty God, through the teaching of his word, establish us into becoming effective prayer people so that we can have answers in our generation. Call upon me and I will answer and show you great and wonderful things. We want to see great and wonderful things happen in our generation, but we must first qualify. I've stated as I began this session that a qualification by definition means meeting conditions so that rights can be given. It has to do with you meeting specific conditions so that a right can be granted. Now, the second qualification of prayer goes with what we just quoted and read. And I want uh, us to put it on record so that we can explain what it means as well. So the second qualification of prayer is keeping commandments. Now, First John chapter number three, verse 22 provides us with two conditions uh, and and those two uh, conditions gives us the third the second and the third qualifications for prayer so i'm just going to separate them before we read the verse so that i can have an opportunity to explain or define their meaning so the second qualification of prayer is keeping his commandments 
Now, what does it mean then to keep his uh, commandments? Uh, remember uh, the whole issue of most of us are familiar with the Ten Commandments and so on. And we know that when Christ summarizes uh, the Ten Commandments, the key word there is love. And I'm also concerned about a generation that, love, that likes to quote the love of God outside the context of the law of God. But for now, I just want us to read um, the verse connected with the second qualification. First John, Apostle John the Revelator, chapter number three, verse 22, Mbuli will read for us. And we will unpack a few things concerning the second qualification. First John chapter number three, verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Wow. Whatsoever we ask, we receive. Can you see the guarantee there? Because we keep his commandments. What a qualification. Because we keep his commandments. In other words, I should be in prayer. I should be working more to qualify than just to have words to say before God. It is very important for one to qualify before they pray. So this second qualification has to do with the fact that uh, I keep his uh, commandments. Am I an obedient believer? Am I obeying God's commandments? Thou shall not steal. Am I obeying his uh, uh, commandments? All these commandments are fulfilled in one word, all right? They are fulfilled in one word. Jesus says, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your heart, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. We are also told that none of us, John the Revelator says, that none of us can say they love men, they love God, who they do not see but hate their brother that they see here on earth. So the condition here in the keeping of the commandments is connected with the principle of loving the Lord your God with all your heart and loving your neighbor, uh, loving your neighbor uh, as you love yourself. So what does that all mean? It means if you fail to walk with love towards God, and towards men, you have not met the qualifications for prayer. No wonder some prayers are not answered. It is very much key that saints need to be healed from issues of the past, whether it be bitterness, whether it be pain, and I'm coming to that qualification. Um, but more than anything here, I'm emphasizing scripturally the issue of ensuring that you become an obedient child of God. Obedience is indeed better than sacrifice. It's okay that we have faith, but it's another thing that you are commanded as a child of God to obey. So this is the commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But I would love us to also read this verse that speaks into this. John chapter number 15, put that on our check session, verse number 14 to 17. This is Christ speaking to the disciple in that upper room discourse, and he's unpacking things that speaks into his relationship with the Father and them. He explains the Holy Spirit. He, he, he actually unpacks who the Holy Spirit is. Can we read that verse from verse 14 to 17 as we continue? John 15, verse 14 to 17. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the father in my name he will give you. Verse 17, these things I command you that you love one another. Hmm. Wow. These things I command you that you love one another. If you keep my commandments, you are my friends. I no longer call you servants. Prayer is relational. 
Prayer is all about the relationship you actually have with God. And you can have many words in prayer, but you definitely cannot afford to fake a relationship with God. It must be a genuine relationship uh, that you have with him, such that he goes as far as calling you friends. So Abraham was a friend of God. Why? He obeyed God's commandments. Jesus is calling his disciple friends. Why? Because they obey his commandments. So before you sing a song, I'm a friend of God, you should be able to say or ask or answer as a child of God, am I obedient to his commandments? And this is again a condition to prayer. Remember, prayer is not just me. It's not a monologue. Prayer is a dialogue. So before I open my mouth to speak to God, uh, practicing prayer as an aspect of worship, I should be in relationship with God. Am I praying as a friend? And if you are praying as his friend, you are most guaranteed to receive what you ask because you are also shaped by the fact that uh, you abide in him. The second thing that we read again in 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, it gives us the third qualification for prayer. Let's read the verse again, and I am going to state the associated verses. Third qualification for prayer is Doing what pleases him. Doing what pleases him. Doing what pleases him. It's connected to keeping the commandments. It's connected to, to, to prayer. But it has to do with one thing that I want to highlight today that is very much key in John 15, verse 8. Let's read First John chapter 3, verse 22 again. Ambuli. First John chapter number 3, verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Amen. Whatsoever we ask from him. So the whatsoever is connected to these conditions. Whatsoever we ask from him, we receive because we keep his commandment and we do those things that pleases him. So what does it mean to please God? Here's a verse for you. John chapter 15, verse number eight. We are going to... Look into that verse. John chapter 15, verse 28. What does it mean to be pleasing him? I, I, I love the fact that the Bible says that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And it says, hear him. Christ was doing what pleases God. So what does it mean to please God? John 15, verse 8. Can we read that? As we have that on our chest section already. John 15, verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Amen. So, pleasing God involves bearing fruit. The Father is glorified when we bear fruit. And this fruit has to do, like I said last week, it has to do with... Uh, Christ-likeness. The Father is pleased when we do those things that makes us to look like our Father who is in heaven. Jesus even went as far as saying as he was teaching in the Beatitudes, he said, when you do those things uh, that the Father is pleased, you, you would have reward, rewards from, from the Father. So those things that glorify him are the things that pleases him. So you must be preoccupied with producing fruit that glorifies God. Are you involved? Are you part of, of everything that glorifies God? Have you asked yourself with anything that you are committed in doing in the name of the Lord that you are in actual fact glorifying the Lord? So that's a very key verse on our third qualification of prayer is that we must be doing what pleases him. Those are the people who qualify to pray, who keep his commandments and who do what pleases him. The fourth qualification, uh, we are going to read Mark chapter 11, verse 25. That is a key qualification, the main hindrance for prayer. And I must also state that prayerlessness is not a weakness. It is a sin, Bazalwa, not to pray. 
if I were to put it that way. Hence, we ought to pray without ceasing. It will lead you to many troubles if you do not pray. And prayer is mostly destroyed by distractions. You should have an hour of prayer, the discipline of prayer. You should have an open heart in terms of prayer, whether it be speaking in tongues and all of that, just have an open flow in as far as the issue of prayer is concerned. But qualification number four is the hindrance, main hindrance to prayer. Mark 11, 25, Mbuli reads so I can state the qualification. Mark 11, verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. When you pray or when you stand praying, forgive, so that our heavenly Father can forgive you also. So this is the main hindrance to prayer that we could be saying to God all the right things, but if we have a heart of unforgiveness, it hinders prayer. In fact, it becomes a disqualification for prayer. So the fourth qualification for prayer is that when you stand praying, forgive. Whatever that was done against you, forgive. And your heavenly Father will forgive you and also respond or attend to your petitions in terms of prayer. I'm not going to stay much on that, but this is a very key hindrance to prayer uh, to us as children of God. The minute you meet this qualification, you have seriously positioned yourself to receiving answers from the Lord in prayer, so that prayer does not then become a futile exercise, but a productive and effective exercise. With unforgiveness in your heart, prayer is already hindered. Let's go to the fifth qualification. First John chapter number five, verse 14 to 15. First John chapter number five, verse 14 to, to 15. We are going to read that. But let me state what is this qualification before we read. The fifth qualification is that you ought to be praying according to the will of God. You ought to be praying according to the will of God. It is the will of God that ought to be shaping your prayer life, not just your own desires. Now let's read 1 John chapter 5. Let's hear what the apostle has to say as he is giving us a qualification for prayer. That's John 5, 14 to 15, says. Bully? First John chapter number 5, verse 14 to 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that mm -hmm. if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Verse 15. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Praying according to his will grants us the confidence of knowing that we have received what we prayed for. This is a key qualification as well. Praying according to his will. You can't be asking God things that are outside his will. And we don't get to a place of knowing his will personally in our lives if we do not abide with him. If we do not we are not discipled by him, if we are not led by him, and I'm speaking that on a personal level. Now, this condition of praying according to his will, how would you pray according to his will if you do not know his word? Because his word provides us with his will. So if you are a Christian, you are not meditating on God's word. You do not know the will of God in a specific area. You could be praying about your marriage. You could be praying about your career. You could be praying about your ministry. You could be praying about any fact uh, in life that is already covered by the sufficiency of God's word in the scriptures. But if you do not know what scripture has to say on a specific issue, you would pray amiss and then disqualify yourself in prayer. So this is a qualification that comes with a condition for you to study the word. You ought to commit in knowing the word because it seems 
It is people who know the word who become effective in prayer. They stop wasting themselves time, time saying so many words before God, like the Gentiles who keep repeating things while the Bible already has said that your heavenly father knows that you need these things. So, so that you can avoid praying like a pagan with desperation. When you know the will of God, you have this confidence. And this confidence also adds to the fact that you know that he hears you. And he, if he hears you, then he answers you. This is a very key qualification, but it comes again with another condition, the condition to know the will of God. So there are other areas where someone can be saying for this, but I don't know. Uh, 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 I'm praying about an area where I'm not clear what the Bible is saying on that particular area. Hence, we have the Holy Spirit. Hence, we have uh, teachers of the word. Hence, we have uh, guides in terms of uh, those who lead us or, or, or spiritual leadership over us to guide us under such things so that we can know how to pray effectively and properly as the children of God. So please, this is a very key qualification. So that I don't waste time. Uh, the sixth qualification is found in James chapter number four. We put that on our chest section, yes? Chap chapter, James chapter number four, verse number three. <clears throat> and this qualification can actually, actually serve as a disqualification. Check your motives when you pray. This can be a disqualification. Check your motives. Pray with proper motives. If you're asking for a house, if you're asking for a car, if you're asking for a husband, if you're asking for this, make sure that your motives are pure. Otherwise, prayer becomes a futile exercise. Qualification number six. When you pray, check your motives. Would you please read for us James chapter number four, verse number three, as we also put that on our chat section. James 4, verse number 3. You ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Amen. You ask and you do not receive, because you are not doing any pure motives, so that you can brag about it, so that you can boast about it. Those are the things that actually disqualify our prayers before God. This qualification is important, that check the motives of your heart. Check that you have impure motives, because by the way, God already knows your needs. Why do you ask for what you have? That is very important before the throne. Come before the throne of grace in order for you to find grace and obtain mercy, or obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. But do check your motives, because your motive my motives might become, your impure motives might become a disqualification to pray. No wonder so many prayers, so many cries have not been heard or answered by God. Motives. The last qualification in terms of prayer is found in the Old Testament. Familiar text. I know in this time, while we are going through the value of the shadow of death, everyone is quoting this. This qualification is necessary. When the nation quoting Solomon as he was dedicating the temple and uh, the glory of the Lord came upon the temple so that the priest could not actually minister. Amen. I just have something in my spirit. Um, I want just to state it and I'll go to the qualification. Pumzile. Uh, uh, and the Lord says he is raising he is raising you as a new breed as a fresh voice the Lord is granting you the spirit of wisdom the spirit of knowledge and understanding of the scriptures so you can also teach others do not uh, be moved by those who continue to say a woman cannot minister or teach because that's what I see you doing. You'll be doing it in your generation and God will be using you very strongly for your generation 
And uh, I wanted to know that uh, you are going to influence and make an impact to the life of many people because God has entrusted so much with you. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of the scriptures. The word of the Lord in your mouth, the scriptures being taught with such clarity and with such power. And it will bring about the change and transformation. Most people that will encounter the ministry of the word in your life will experience transformation. Amen. Last qualifications. Second Chronicles chapter number seven, verse number 14. Please read for me, um, Bully. Second Chronicles chapter number seven, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, sin and heal their land. The last qualifications to everyone, don't forget, who prays in the name of the Lord. If my people who are called by my name, it can also be the people who are praying according to his name. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves. So the seventh qualification is the attitude of the people who pray. The proper attitude of the people who pray. The people of prayer ought to have good, pure, and uh, godly attitude. The attitude of those who pray, the attitude of those who pray is important as a qualification. Now, when you unpack Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 7, 14, that proper attitude involves, if my people who are called by my name, it involves humble themselves. Now, I'm not talking about acting humble. I'm not talking about, ironically, false um, humility. I'm talking about the state of the heart. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, then presents their petition. And then God says, he will hear from heaven and he will forgive our sins and forgive our, 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 uh, and, and heal our land forgive our sins and heal our land. So saints, these are the qualifications of prayer that those who pray must meet this qualification. Without these qualifications, we do not meet the conditions that gives us the right to pray. And these are given to us from the Holy Scriptures. This is the Holy Spirit setting the order and the Holy Spirit providing us on how we ought to approach, especially when we are praying in his name while we are expecting to receive from him as we meet these conditions. And the good thing about them, if you go through them after this meeting and you check, you would then realize, put it, by the way, these things are actually shaping my prayer life. They actually take you back to the Lord. They actually take you back to the world. They actually take you back to relationship that the people, the, in fact, in summary, the greatest qualification in prayer, if I summarize all of them, is that those that are truly friends of God have the right to pray. May God bless you and increase you and cause his face to shine on you. May you revisit your prayer points and double check with these qualifications, and you will begin to see an answer from the Lord because he sanctifies us through his word and his word is truth. To God be the glory and thank you for your time. Enjoy your Sunday. Amen.